All right, Joe, so 7.5 theories of development. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. And so what this, this unit is all about is uh, take a look at this picture. And so this is GNI per capita, gross national income per capita in 2018. And these, again, are, are measured in U.S. dollars. And so this would be like living in the U.S. based off of this income. And so the question this, this, uh, this section is trying to answer is, why does this map look like it does? Why is there so much wealth here and so little wealth here? Okay, uh, why is the world, you know, there, there's, there's vast resources around the world. Uh, why are there such vast uh, differences in wealth and uh, development throughout the world uh, also? And so this is one of those, this is an attempt to try to explain some of those, some of those rationales. All right, um, so there's gonna be four different uh, theories that you need to know. One is this one, Rostow's stages of economic economic growth or development, uh, Wallerstein's world system theory. We've mentioned this a little bit before. This is the core periphery stuff. Uh, dependency theory and commodity dependence. Okay, and so these are hopefully going to help the, explain the spatial variations in development. And again, when we talk about spatial variations in development, spatial just means why are things where they are on a map? You know, and so again, looking at the the big wealth uh, there, there, there. Uh, there, there. Uh, so, you know, it, get the idea. Uh, and so what is it? What, why does this look like this? So here we go. Uh, so this is Rosto. So the easiest thing, we're going to go through these stages. I'm going to try and make it quick. Uh, but uh, the easiest thing to think about, there are five stages of development for Rosto. And we've talked about these. We talked about the primary, secondary, and tertiary sector. And we also talked about how as economies develop, then they go away from, so they start in the primary. And once you get highly developed, you are very much in the tertiary sector. And so what the what Rosto stages uh, suggest is that there's this, you know, moving from one point to the next to the next. Uh, and so you can see here the, in the first stage, and these are the names of each stage. So that's stage one, two, three, four, and five. It looks like a four. Uh, and so stage one, the traditional society, preconditions for takeoff, takeoff, uh, drive to maturity, and then high mass consumption. And so you can see what happens with each sector. So uh, we know stage one, very big primary sector. Uh, still in stage two it is, uh, but then it starts to go down. So declining few and very few. Secondary sector, that's manufacturing. Remember, so primary was uh, raw materials. Uh, and this is manufacturing. And so uh, in traditional society, there's very little manufacturing. It's mostly just primary. Uh, but then we start to build up some of that manufacturing sector. Then you get to very rapid growth in the takeoff. And then it kind of stabilizes out. And then you actually start making less, start manufacturing less stuff. Uh, and then again, with the tertiary sector, that's the services. If you recall, uh, very little in the traditional, very little in the pre-takeoff. Uh, they start to come around uh, when countries do take off, uh, and then they grow rapidly in stage four, and then by stage five, and this is where the U.S. is, this is where all the, the wealthy countries are today, uh, it is the tertiary sector is the vast majority of their economy. And so, you know, if, if you're trying to think about uh, these stages of development, think about, you know, where they are where a country is in terms of their economic sectors. And we did that activity in class the other day that showed all the different regions and, and you know, the, the number of people working in uh, the different economic sectors. So uh, a couple of assumptions here real quick. Uh, Rosto believes that all countries were capable of modernizing, developing, and rising out of poverty. Now he did this by looking at the Western countries that had already done all this. And so he said, well, the US did it and uh, England did it and you know some of these other European countries did it and so it must therefore work for every country and that that's definitely one of the limitations of, of Rosto uh, it, it's you know putting this one one size fits all to all countries around the world and we know that that's probably not not mostly accurate uh, and so uh, he did believe that uh, LDCs less developed countries would have to follow the stages of economic growth uh, that, that there were no shortcuts okay and so let's look real quick. I'm going to go through this kind of fast. Uh, I've got my uh, stopwatch going over here. I forgot to start it. So, uh, so anyway, so stage one, traditional society, uh, very little infrastructure, subsistence farming. It is mostly primary sector. 
uh, people engaged in agriculture, they are dependent on a rural economy. Okay, and so you can see this is what it might look like. Uh, village in Lesotho, 86% uh, of the residents' workforce were in subsistence agriculture. And so that would be an example of a stage one uh, for Rosto. Uh, stage two is what they call the transition stage. And so now they're starting to get some of the tools uh, for agriculture. And so here's kind of the idea. They start to gain a surplus. It's no longer subsistence agriculture. They can gain a surplus in agriculture and they can start to sell that surplus uh, to other markets. Okay. And so when they get the money for the surplus, the key for this stage is to develop the infrastructure and the industries with that money that they've gotten from their surplus uh, and start that process. So if they're just taking their money and not using it for anything in terms of inf infrastructure or any other kinds of, of development investment, uh, then that's gonna be a problem, they're gonna stay stuck. But if they can use this surplus cash, uh, then they can now uh, start to build up an infrastructure, start to you know build schools and uh, a little more more healthcare facilities, things like that. Uh, you can see agriculture becomes more commercialized and mechanized, uh, and so still not it's still mostly primary, but they are starting to get uh, some commercial activity. All right, so shift from agrarian to an industrial manufacturing society begins, but it is very slow at this point. Uh, then we have stage three, which is the takeoff, uh, and so. Uh, the, the, the country starts to invest in themselves. So uh, the money that they're getting from their businesses, they start to invest in uh, machinery capital is what we call it. Uh, and so factory, they start to build factories and all that kind of stuff. And so we start to see this, this takeoff of their productive capacity. And so you can see here uh, in England, 1783 to 1802, uh, the US 1843 to 1860. And so this is kind of the, you know, after the industrial revolution gets going. So this is uh, big time in the US. So we start to take off, we start the manufacturing. Uh, we're not a, a huge manufacturer yet, but it is starting. And again, I refer you back to that one, that, that one of those first slides that said, hey, the, the secondary sector, it's, it's starting to grow. All right, uh, there's an example today, uh, Equatorial Guinea. Uh, largest increase in GDP growth since 1980. So we do start to see a, a rapid increase in GDP. Uh, productive investment has risen up. Uh, and so their incomes are rising. They are investing back into their economy. And so that's what I mean by takeoff. Uh, maturity. So now we have a long period of sustained growth. Uh, they're investing a lot of their money in the country in terms of capital. Uh, again, capital means machinery, businesses, things like that. Uh, manufacturing shifts from investment driven to capital goods uh, towards now we have this thing called durable goods. And so a durable good, there's actually a definition here for it. Uh, it's a good that lasts at least three years. And so things like cars and appliances, uh, th those are the kinds of things that are starting to be produced within a country. All right. Uh, there's rapid development of transportation infrastructure, investment in social infrastructure like schools, universities. And so uh, that stuff starts to really, really ramp up. Uh, and you can see here for the U.S., that would be, be 1900. Russia was 1950, right after World War II. Uh, Great Britain around 1850. So uh, the example today would be South Africa. Uh, big infrastructure, modern transportation network, uh, widely available energy. Their commercial farming sector uh, shed 140,000 jobs, which is uh, declining about 20%. And remember those jobs, you know, they're losing them in agriculture, but those people are now moving on to manufacturing and some people are moving on into the tertiary uh, sector. So uh, the diversity uh, leads to reduction in poverty, increasing standards of living. Uh, and so you don't have to sacrifice your comfort in order to build up certain sectors. All right. Uh, and then finally, uh, stage five, this is high mass consumption. Uh, this is what we are today. So uh, it's generally kind of thought that the U.S. was the first country to hit this high mass consumption, uh, followed by Europe, uh, European nations, then uh, Japan in the 1950s. And so, again, uh, service sector becomes dominant. You know, we've, we've even decreased more uh, in terms of primary, uh, primary sector. Uh, our manufacturing sector might start to go down a bit, uh, but our tertiary sector is extremely high. Uh, people have disposable income. Disposable means uh, it's just to spend as you see fit, not necessarily, you, you'll spend some of it on necessities, but now you have extra money after that 
where you can buy some of these luxury goods, right? Uh, these are things that you don't absolutely need to live, but they make life comfortable. Uh, and this is uh, kind of a decent way to sum it up. Uh, at, at this point, society itself is able to choose between concentrating on military and security issues, equality and welfare issues, developing uh, greater luxuries for its upper class. And so, you know, that's when, once you hit this stage, this is what Rosto is saying, uh, you know, society has a choice for. And so uh, we have debates, you know, this is what politics is all about in the U.S. You know, what, what do we want our taxes going for? What do we want to focus on as an economy? So, uh, so that's Rosto. Uh, again, uh, the five stages going from uh, subsistence farming to basically what the U.S. is now. All right, uh, then we have Wallerstein's World Systems Theory, and I said we mentioned this. Uh, this is, I've talked about the core and periphery uh, before, and so this is what it is. So, uh, so Wallerstein, if you take a look at the map, you can kind of start to, to guess what we mean by core and what we mean by periphery. Uh, so you can see the U.S. and Canada are core, Western Europe is core, uh, Northern Europe core, Australia. Uh, and then we have semi-periphery, so China, India, uh, Brazil, Mexico, uh, and so, uh, and then we have uh, periphery countries. And so let's take a look at, at how we define those. So uh, he believed, so Wallerstein believed uh, that all country in today's world are interdependent, that we rely on each other, uh, and that if one of us has a problem, it will affect other people. And so uh, he believed that some countries would be exploited uh, for profit. Uh, and that would come from the wealthy countries exploiting the poorer countries. And we'll talk about what these mean in just a second. Uh, but take, well, let's do it now. Uh, take a look. So core countries, generally these are going to be the advanced economies. So high profit consumption goods. So they're the ones that are producing the high dollar value stuff. All right. When they produce that stuff, they sell it to both periphery countries. And those are the ones that are supplying the cheap labor and raw materials. And so the core gets... Uh, the cheap labor and raw materials from the periphery, they turn it into more expensive things, and then they sell it back to the periphery. Okay, and so the semi-periphery, they have combinations of both. Uh, they have some cheap labor and raw materials, uh, which they would provide to the core countries here, and they also do produce and manufacture some, which they would sell to the periphery there. All right, and so that's kind of how this works. So uh, core, again, high income uh, development, U.S., Western Europe, Japan, Australia, Canada, uh, the periphery, this is the lower income uh, or underdeveloped. And again, it's all about exporting raw materials. Sounds a little bit like colonialism uh, or neocolonialism, as we might say today. Uh, and then the semi-periphery, again, those are the countries that are in the middle. Uh, and so take a look at this. This is an acronym that I want you to know. It used to just be BRIC, B-R-I-C countries. Uh, and then they added the M and the S. And so BRIC countries, in, if, you, if you're reading anything and you see that, uh, it stands for Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Uh, and then they have added on Mexico and South Africa. So now it's BRIC MS. Uh, and so those are the countries that are semi-periphery. And if you go back to this map, I just noticed this. Uh, this map uh, considered them a periphery country. Whereas, you know, if we, using another definition or different different metrics, uh, that would be considered a semi-periphery today. So, uh, all so that's Wallerstein's world theory. Now let's take a look real quick at a, a case study uh, of a periphery country. And this is the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is, it's a very sad story uh, because they have had a lot, a lot of strife uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It used to be called Zaire, uh, but obviously it was colonized. Uh, if you look, let me fast forward a little bit. Uh, if you look at, at uh, DRC, that's what we'll call it from now on, uh, DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. If you look at all of this, these are all the minerals uh, and resources that are in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. And so that that's, you know, people want all of that stuff. So you can see dense forests. Uh, so anyway, so let's go back. And this is cobalt. So we're going to talk about cobalt here for just a second. So Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, you can see this is cobalt production here, red on red, smart. Uh, and so uh, the DRC has, what year is this, 20, 2018. Uh, so in 2018, uh, DRC was responsible for 64% of all cobalt mining in the world. Now, question is, what is cobalt used for? It is necessary for lithium ion batteries. And lithium ion batteries are kind of 
a big thing. Uh, they're using electric cars, laptops, smartphones. And so uh, as the demand for these things are growing and, and electric cars are growing a bunch, the demand for this, uh, for the cobalt is going to go up a lot. And so you would think that this would be a good thing because if you're in a country and you have a resource that everybody wants, it means they'll pay you a lot more for it. Uh, but there is this thing called the resource curse. All right. Uh, and so one of the problems that uh, when we look at some of these countries, a couple of couple of issues rise up. Uh, one is that there's often high levels of corruption within the government. And so the money that the government might be getting paid for these resources is not being funneled back into the country in terms of creating infrastructure and more education, more hospitals, things like that. Uh, and so that's one of the problems. All right. So uh, more corruption because more money, more corruption. More money can lead to more violence, and DRC is a is is sadly a very violent place, uh, in in some parts. Okay, not the whole country, but uh, in some parts, that money breeds the violence, uh, and that's true in lots of places around the world. Look at the drug war here. Uh, so anyway, and the other big thing that that's part of this resource curse is that you know all these people that go and work in in these mines, uh, they are. Uh, not starting businesses in other areas, okay? And so uh, the, the economies become focused on a couple of things instead of diversifying and having a lot of different stuff. Uh, and that can be kind of bad for the country uh, as well. And so when we look at this, uh, there is 50% in Congo, an extreme poverty rate of 50% uh, with long history of violence and insecurity. And again, this really kind of started with uh, colonization. So, uh, but they do have very poor infrastructure. And so China, uh, remember China's uh, in that, that core, that uh, semi-periphery and where they are producing stuff and they have raw materials, but they're producing a lot of this stuff for the batteries. And so China's in the DRC, uh, they're the biggest trading partner. And so they want uh, all of this uh, cobalt, all right, as much as they can get. And so, and you can see why, you know, we, we love our iPhones, uh, electric cars and laptops. Right. And so, you know, when we when we look at these these periphery countries, they have all these resources. Uh, but just because we're buying the resources from them, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be a lot better off. You need a stable government, a transparent government uh, where corruption is is discouraged and held to account. Uh, and you need that money reinvested in the country in things like uh, schools and other infrastructure. Uh, and healthcare, and that's the problem. You know, when you think about these resources, uh, and this is, by the way, uh, cobalt. You generally don't just mine for cobalt. It is a byproduct of copper mining and nickel mining. So I'm not sure if this is a copper or a nickel mine, but uh, those things are found together. Okay, uh, but you know, the question is, who owns this? You know, uh, so if this is owned by a private individual, then they might just spend the money on themselves. If this is owned by the government and it's a corrupt government, then the money doesn't find its way back into the country. Okay. And so that's a problem. And so, you know, when you look at a country like this, when you see all of these different resources, uh, you would think, hey, they're doing great. Uh, but when you look at the GNI per capita, gross national income per capita of the Democratic Republic of Congo, it is a whopping $530 a year. All right. Again, that's like living, trying to live off of 530 bucks a year in the U.S. Uh, their GDP is about $50 billion, uh, scratch that. And so, you know, it, it's not, 50 billion does not rank very high. Uh, California, and this is kind of a, 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 a trick question, California's GDP would put them somewhere around like the fifth wealthiest country in the world. So uh, that's really not, they're like, California's like three or $4 trillion. Uh, their GDP alone as a state, uh, and so it, it dwarfs, you know, what, what the Democratic Republic of Congo is. So anyway, so that would be an example of a periphery country. Uh, they are staying poor, even though they have all of this, this vast mineral wealth uh, that they should be able to take advantage of, but for various reasons, uh, that money is not finding its way back into the people. Uh, and so you can see this one, uh, Apple and Google named in U.S. lawsuit over Congolese child cobalt mining deaths. Uh, and so it shouldn't surprise you after watching uh, videos about chocolate uh, agriculture and uh, uh, coffee agriculture that there would be child labor here. Uh, it is sad, but it happens. And so uh, they are trying, some people are trying to, to bring about the awareness and nothing will bring about awareness than suing somebody uh, as part of 
being somewhat responsible for the death of kids uh, working in mines. And so you can see Dell, Microsoft, Tesla, uh, also among tech firms named in the case. And so they're buying, the idea is that these companies are buying cobalt from uh, DRC and children are being used in these mines uh, to get the cobalt, you know? And so the question is, would you buy that cell phone if you thought that a kid had mined all of the cobalt necessary for the battery? All right. Uh, so real quick, a couple of limitations of these theories. So here's Rosto, uh, explains the development experience of the West. So these are it's primarily based on European countries uh, and America. Doesn't necessarily, you know, there's, there's different cultural values when you start going outside of those places, obviously. Uh, Rosto assumes all countries will, will modernize and develop. Uh, what if they don't have great resources? So if you look at a country, uh, well, different countries around the world that, that just have very few resources available, will they be able to take those steps uh, will they be able to take off? All right. Uh, what if their government, you know, isn't is maintains its corruption, that kind of stuff. Uh, and so those are some limitations of the theory. Uh, Wallerstein looks at it, uh, and his approach is strictly economic. Doesn't factor in political and social issues. And so you can imagine how this would be a problem. If you look at a country like Niger, uh, their literacy rate is only thirty percent. That's going to keep them uh, as a periphery country. And so you know. It, a more holistic look at, at a country uh, would be the argument against what Wallerstein is doing. Uh, but Wallerstein's model can be applied at different scales, uh, regional, national, subnational. Uh, if you think about a state, an individual state, so Arizona, uh, could we break Arizona down into core cities, uh, periphery cities, and then semi-periphery cities? Probably so. All right, so that's, that's kind of the sense there. All right, two more. Uh, Dependency theory. Uh, so dependency theory, and again, we're trying to explain why the world looks like it does in terms of income distribution uh, or wealth distribution. Uh, it's the idea that resources flow from the poor and underdeveloped states, the periphery, uh, to the wealthy states, all right? And those countries become dependent on it. And so again, if we look at a map of Africa's natural resources, uh, and here's DRC that we were just looking at, cobalt sitting there, uh, you know, the natural resources here are 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 vast, obviously, uh, and that's why European countries colonized there uh, to get all those resources. And so the dependency theory kind of goes like this: uh, there's a relationship between the core and periphery, uh, between the flow of 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 resources uh, from the periphery to the core, uh, and so the wealthier countries uh, get wealthier by purchasing the natural resources. And so you know, let's take uh, the United Kingdom up here, England. Uh, they're buying their resources from Africa, right? Uh, let's just say they're buying it from uh, cobalt from Democratic Republic of Congo. And so they get the cobalt, uh, and then they produce cell phones. And so they're going to take these cell phones and turn back and sell them to the DR people in DRC. And so the core buys the raw materials and uses the cheap labor uh, to help make the products. And so there might be some manufacturing here of some of the lower end stuff. Uh, and so uh, this keeps uh, these perif core, the periphery countries uh, dependent on the actions of the wealthy countries or the core countries, all right? Uh, because if the core countries leave, uh, then the, the periphery countries don't have the ability to do what the core could. Uh, and so again, they're selling their resources uh, and then they're buying the products that were made. This is very similar to colonialism. Uh, so that's uh, dependency theory. Uh, let's see, we'll leave it at that. Uh, and then the last one is commodity dependence. Uh, so real, again, we've talked about this before, commodity, what is a commodity? Uh, raw material or agricultural product that can be bought and sold. Uh, so for example, coffee, beans, uh, bananas, cobalt, cotton, copper, all that kind of stuff. So those are all commodities. And so a country is considered a commodity export is considered commodity export dependent when more than 60% of its exports are commodities. All right. And so if they're producing these raw materials, this is primary sector stuff. So if 60% if of their exports are uh, commodities or the, the raw materials, they are considered a commodity dependent country. And so here's one of the problems with that. Uh, commodities are vulnerable to price fluctuations. And this is always going to happen. But the problem is, if you're a country and you are reliant on those commodities, if the price of that commodity drops on a, on, uh, in the world market, 
uh, then you've just lost a whole lot of money. Okay, so let's take a look real quick. Uh, wow, these are hard to, to read here. Uh, so this is just some examples of different commodity prices. So this is copper. Uh, so this is, I don't know how they, they do this per ounce or something, uh, but this would be, take a look at, uh, this is inflation adjusted. So take a look at the red line. So it goes from a buck, what, buck 25 here to a high of 475 there. And so that's a huge fluctuation in terms of percentage terms. And so if you're reliant on the price of copper, I mean, take a look, you know, starting here, you are extremely happy. And then now you're like, uh oh, this is really bad because those copper producing countries just lost a whole lot of money. Then it comes back. And so it's a bit of a wild ride. Uh, this next one, let's see, oops, sorry. Uh, so this is coffee, uh, the price of coffee. And again, it fluctuates. And so if you are a coffee uh, exporting country, you are, a, you are dependent on uh, this price and each individual country uh, doesn't have huge amounts of influence over the, the global price of coffee. This is oil. Okay, you can see over here that's 25 bucks a barrel. Uh, this gets up to a high of 150. That's a huge price fluctuation, right? Uh, you can see when COVID hit, it did that. Uh, and so if you're, again, if you're a country reliant on the oil industry, then this, you have to be ready for the fluctuations. Uh, this is the price of uh, cocoa or cacao. Uh, and again, you can see kind of all over the place, it goes up and down, uh, but this steady trend up is what keeps them growing, okay? This trend up keeps them growing. Uh, these highs keep them producing, and so they're hoping that this goes up, all right? Uh, and let's just take a, a quick look at banana production. So this is, uh, so bananas would be a commodity. Uh, there is a, a disease in Asia uh, with some of the, the bananas there, and they're worried that it might have come over and reached some of the Latin American countries. Uh, and so if it does, that will kill off a bunch of the bananas here in Latin America. Uh, and so if you're an exporting country of bananas, uh, this could have a, a pretty big impact on you. Now, it will drive up the price, but the supply is going to go way down, okay? And so uh, they probably won't make as much money as they, as they could have. So you can see if, if that happens, uh, this is banana production in tons. Uh, Brazil would be hit. Mexico would be hit. Uh, those are kind of the two big ones over here. And you can see down here, uh, let's see, Peru, Brazil. So Brazil would probably be okay because, you know, you can see here agriculture's percentage of GDP is only 5.7%. And so, you know, that's, that's all agriculture for them. And so this is one small part of their overall agricultural production. And so would that devastate their country? No. Okay, uh, would it cause problems for people in the banana industry there? Yes, okay. Uh, and so that's kind of, you know, when we look at it, uh, you can see in Brazil, in Brazil, 11% uh, of the labor force is involved in uh, agriculture. Agriculture is a percentage of exports, 34%. And so again, uh, those bananas are part of it, beef is another part of it, uh, but that could have a, a, a pretty decent impact uh, on, on the farmers there. Uh, all righty. So uh, that's it. Sorry for the length there, but I tried. Take care.